Welcome to Nick's Home Court with your host, Greg Armstrong. Phil Jackson says, I like this team. Then takes a trip to Montana. Dwayne Wade sends Pat Riley a fax. I'm leaving on the next plane. Charles Barkley, stop hating. Hating that. Mellow gets righteous on us. All praise is due, my brother. Coming up on Nick's Home Court. Questions to Carmelo was <clears throat> postseason. You know, we haven't made the playoffs. Uh, this is now three years, two years of, since I've been here. Um, and are we moving quickly enough for you in your anticipation of trying to be into a competitive playoff situation? And you know, I think that was our conversation that established the fact that his desire and you know. The idea that, you know, he is getting into an an age range where things have to happen for him. Of course, that was Phil Jackson. Uh, Let me adjust my seat. Yeah, that was Phil Jackson in the press conference they had this Friday, this past Friday. Talking about Carmelo Anthony and um, his desire to win now. Um, One thing I could say about Carmelo is he's been very consistent about wanting to be here and wanting to win here. There's no doubt about that. And um, he's also asked to play with a point guard. You know, I hear people talk about Carmelo being ball don- dominant and things like that. But I don't think he's like that. I think he's more of a need-based player. When he has a good point guard, he has no problem not having the ball. And then people say that after this year, he actually averaged a career high in assists. So he gave up the ball a lot. You understand, he's plays. He's 32. He fills his body. He's still very good, but he's probably getting wiser and he's understanding. I don't need to be Hercules to win games, you know, just in moments. If I need to carry the team from moment to moment, I'm good with that. But the whole game to do every single thing, I think he's understanding that he doesn't have to do that any longer. And that's why he wanted, he wants some better players with him, you know, and I must say this is probably in terms of talent, not count injury in terms of talent talent this is probably the best team that's ever been put around mellow and that and, and that's that's saying a lot you know you know so this friday the knicks introduced their uh, the free agent signings uh joe kim noah courtney lee and brandon jennings you know after trading for derrick rose so uh they have a good little thing going on here, you know. Uh, they also signed Marshall Plumley. I thought they had signed Ron Baker, but I realized they haven't signed Ron Baker, which is which is the guy I thought they were going to sign, or maybe they signed him to a partial uh, a partial uh, contract. I'm still checking on that. They also ch- uh, signed Billy Hernan Gomez. <laughs> Billy, you know it's. Spelt Willie, but it's pronounced Billy. <laughs> uh, also, Coos. I'm going to say Coos. I'm not going to try to say the guy's name. For short, they call him Mindy. You know, here they're going to be calling him Coos. I can see it now. If he hits a shot or does something really good, they're going to be like Coos, Coos, like Bob Coosie, but with a K. And he's going to be taking Derrick Rose's, I mean, Derrick Rose's, I'm sorry, Derrick Williams' spot. You know, Derrick Williams was a good transition player, but not really a good three-point shooter. And this guy is supposedly supposed to be a better three-point shooter, you know. And, um, you know, so that's that's that, you know. And and basically, and this has been Knicks news. I haven't even, (laughs) I didn't even say that at the beginning, but this is the Knicks news of the week. You know, so now they have a nice they have a nice roster. They have a nice starting five. Um, they have a six man in Jennings who's going to get about twenty five to thirty minutes a night. You know, same thing with Lance Thomas. Those are going to be the two primary guys off the bench. Um, Kuz is going to have to get time, and so is Justin Holiday. So you know, I'm looking forward to this season, and. Um, I must say, though, uh, Phil has put together a roster. I say Phil like I know him, right? Phil has put together a roster of pl- 
players who all have a chip on his shoulder right now. They're used to winning. I mean, Courtney Lee is a professional. He's what you call a professional basketball player. You put him on the team, and he's he's not going to hurt your team. He's going to help your team. He's going to know his role. He knows he's not a star in the league. He doesn't have a big ego. He's going to hit his open shot. He's going to play his position. He's a guy. He's he's basically what you call a cog. No, he's not going to average 15 points. No, he's not the scorer that Aflalo was. But he's so much more. And what I mean by that is he's a better defender. He's more athletic. He's going to stretch the defense as far as being able to get out on the break. You know, he's one of those cause havoc type players. And he has a good, you know, he's he's good character guy, good attitude. He's only, you know what, he's been blessed in his NBA career. He's only been a part of winning basically his whole career. I mean, he went to the finals in his first year with Orlando. Um, he he went to the playoffs almost every year he was in Memphis. No, actually, he I think every year he was in Memphis. So he's experienced a lot of uh, success. You know, then if you look at uh, Joe Kim Noah, I mean, that Chicago team was considered a championship contender for years. And then Derrick Rose got hurt. And of course, you know, Derrick Rose, he definitely has the biggest chip on his shoulder. Like I said in the previous podcast, he said, ain't nothing sweet. They was asking about other point guards in the league. Does he does he feel like uh, people have passed him by and they're talking about other point guards? And he said, you know, they know my game. They know my game. And they know when we on the court, ain't nothing sweet. Now, that's that's not word for word. I'm paraphrasing phrasing them. But he definitely said, ain't nothing sweet. And, you know, I've been looking at Derrick Rose's clips, right? I looked at, now, I looked at pre-injury Derrick Rose. We're not getting that guy. That guy was like an alien. I mean, the way he would jump, run. I mean, just special. I saw it in Memphis, too. He was an alien. <laughs> he was not human. But let me tell you something about this Derrick Rose, at least from the clips I've seen. He's still deadly. He's still quick. Basically, he's still faster than Chris Paul. He's probably faster than Kyrie Irving. Doesn't mean he's better, but he's faster than these guys. He still has speed. He may not have the same explosion, but he's still fast end to end. He still is a fast guy, and he's 27. Let's not forget that. You know, so he may not have the explosive uh, two-handed tomahawk dunks on people's heads, but I was looking at it, and the NBA players are still afraid of him when he got that ball. You know, he's still very quick. He hasn't lost any of those things. So, you know, just looking forward to those things, you know. And um, like I said, we have another good character guy, uh, glue guy, and um, Thomas. I think he's a great glue guy. I think he's another guy like Lee. He'll do whatever. You know, I think we have a good mixture of scorers, uh, franchise-type players, or that used to be franchise players in Derrick Rose, franchise player in Melo, franchise player in Prazingis, you know, and, and we have glue guys to go along with that. And that's a good mixture. You know, you have Noah. We have guys who are happy with their roles. You know, I will say this. That I think that we need to find a veteran, somebody like a, a, you know, like a Richard Jefferson, like a Vince Carter, you know, somebody who's willing to take a veteran minimum who can come in a game for 10 minutes a game, 10, 12 minutes a game and not mess anything up. You know what I mean? Like young players, I would say the Knicks are seven deep after the seven guys. There's a lot of question marks. There's question marks with Justin holiday. There's question marks with, uh, the new guy Kuz. There's question marks with her, Hernan Gomez. There's, well, you know what? O'Quinn, you know what he is, but it's still, I mean, I guess he's a little solid. He might be the eighth man off the bench because you need definites when you're playing on this level, you know. So, you know, I, I think Phil Jackson has done a really good job, you know, uh, assembling this team. And I think another guy with a chip on his shoulder got to be Brandon Jennings. Brandon Jennings was is, was really becoming a really good player before he heard his, before he, um, what is he, tore, he, tore his ACL? He was becoming a really good player. There's no doubt about that. I was looking, you know, like, I was like, yo, I like, I wanted, the funny thing about this whole free agency period 
is I remember before it started, and I always kept looking at this. I think his website is Sports Track or something, and they was talking about the free, you know, they list the free agencies and think free agent um, players. And I was like, you know what? I didn't. I never wanted Mike Conley because I never thought Mike Conley was worth what he's getting now. He might be worth more that money to Memphis, but I didn't think he was worth that money to the Knicks. So basically, I was like, man, if we can get Brandon Jennings and Kent Bazemore. That's not bad. That makes us a playoff team, you know? And then maybe we have a little money left over. Or maybe, then I was also thinking, maybe we could trade Lopez fatigue. You know, I was thinking things like that. To get Brandon Jennings as a sixth man, he's a starter in the NBA. Let's let's not get it twisted. When he's healthy, he's a starting caliber point guard. So, and for $5 million, pff, that's dope, man. <laughs> There's nothing you can say. I, I don't even have no other words for it. That's dope. You know? But, you know, that has been NBA news. You know, I'm going to stop right there. There's really nothing else to say. They had the press press conference, and um, they introduced the team, and everybody seems happy. Happy they did that. Now the Knicks fans seem to get excited. So, you know, we should get You should get excited. You know, you should get excited. But anyway, that has been Nick news. Now we're going to move on to the next. We're going to move on to NBA news. Man, oh man, talking about NBA news. Dwayne Wade sent Pat Riley a fax. Said, I resign, I resign, motherfucker. (laughs) Actually, that's not what happened. He didn't send him a fax. I was just making fun of the time when um, Pat Riley left the Knicks. He sent a resignation in the form of a fax. You know, so that's why I had said that. No, the truth is, Dwayne Wade, there's there's layers to this. You know, there's there's no, I don't think anybody's wrong in this situation. And just in my opinion, I think that Pat Riley was in a tough position. When you have aging players, Miami probably wasn't really going anywhere. There's a lot of question marks. Uh, We don't know if Bosch is coming back. Now, if Bosch was fully healthy, I can see him saying, you know what? Here you go, Wade. We got you. But Bosch is not, we don't know, people don't know what's going to happen with Bosch, you know, uh, and I think that Pat Riley is trying to keep it going. He's trying to continue to build a team. That's how Pat Riley is. He's thinking winning, he don't care about your feelings. You know, he might be a little bit of an a-hole, but that's his, That's how he get down. And Wade, on the other hand, I feel like, you know, he's not the victim. You know, Chicago signed him to $47 million for two years. Nobody was giving Wade that. Now, I can easily say that no one was giving Wade that, but truth be told, a lot of teams didn't really think he was serious about leaving. So let me let me let me you know, slow down. Let me pull that back a little bit. A lot of teams didn't know Wade was going to leave. And now you look at Chicago, they got Rondo, they got Wade, they got Butler. Now, if they were young, man, they can get out on a break. And I think they're still going to be able to get out on a break. I think that they're still going to, and they're going to have Todd Gibson and, and Robin Lopez. That's a really nice starting five. There's no shooting, but that's a tough team, man. They're going to win some games. They're not going to suck. You know, they, they yeah, you're going to pack the paint, but how many, for years, people have been packing the paint against De- De- um, Dwayne Wade, and he's still been able to score. He's still a good mid-range shooter. Same thing with Rondo. Rondo's played his whole career without being a good shooter and still racks up mad assists so and Butler can shoot he doesn't shoot much like that as far as three point shooting but that team is still going to be decent don't sleep on those te- that team I know it's a weirdly constructed team but they're going to be good you know and um, moving on to uh, KD finally introduced with the Warriors you know uh, I don't really have anything to say I never I didn't really chime in on what I thought about it. I look, these players can do what they want to do. I don't have any whatever, man. He wanted to win. I mean, I, I don't know. I look at things in a in a vision of I look at things I try to look at things with perspective. And I try to think of life in general. And the NBA kinda to me is kind of unfair. You come into the league, you're a top player at your position or a top player in college or a top high school player. You have to go to college for a year. Then when you come out of college, you have to go to usually the worst team in the league, usually. That's why they're able to pick you first. 
And then you have to stay with that team if you want to make the money. You know, for like what? He stayed with uh, Oklahoma City for nine years. A lot of times you got to at least stay uh, six years. They own you for four years. And then you got to, I mean, it's, it's just to me ridiculous, the system, the way it's made up. So when players finally have a choice to say who they're going to pick and who they want to go play with, I have no problem with that. You know, top top uh, lawyers or new lawyers out of law school get to pick where they're going to go. See, this is how I look at this thing. I look at this thing in that terms. All sports. I don't like drafts. I don't like it. You know, Mark Cuban said something that made a lot of sense, that maybe this should not be a draft. Maybe it should just be a negotiation. You can still have a cap maybe on which you can pay the rookies, but it should be open to every team. Because even if it's open to every team, like the number one pick, like say Ben Simmons, he may not want to go to the Sixers, but he ain't going to want to go to uh, probably Golden State either, you know, because he's going to want to play. So I think that it'll be some balance there. But he might just look at a roster and say, hmm, you know what? I'm the missing piece for this team. Like if Ben Simmons had a choice to where he would want to go, he probably would choose a young team and a, a place where they have an opening at the small forward or, or, or power forward. He would he would probably pick a team who has a, a coach that he can relate to rather than going to a team that's in disarray because whoever picks you, one, is a team that's in disarray that has some issues going on right now. And I just think it's unfair to, to force. So, so when I think of it from that perspective, I don't have a problem with Kevin Durant choosing this team, I realize that the society and the public, they can't handle the fact that the GMs don't put together power teams anymore. The players are putting together power teams. The players are doing it. They're looking around and say, yo, you know, they, they play AAU ball with some of these guys and they're looking around and saying, Hey, you know, let's get, let's do this, man. Let's get together and let's win. You know, we cool, we tight, let's do it. And I, and, and, and to me, it's, it's, it's no big deal. It's, it's, I, I think it's awesome, you know, but I'm going to touch on that later when I get to the, what the fuck segment, <laughs> you know, and, uh, well, I already mentioned Rondo went to Boston. So that, that, that's something James Harden also just got a, a $118 million extension. It's going to take him through the 2020 season. I, I get it. I get what the Rockets are trying to do, you know, lock them up, lock up your star, uh, I don't really know how I feel about it. I think that James Harden, uh, he's very talented, but he really has no desire to play defense. I've never seen a guy on a pro level just really don't care. I mean, it's not, I, I can't even say he's bad at defense. He doesn't try, so I can't even, I mean, he does not try. I'm talking about when people are walking past him. I mean, running down, and he just waves at them like he's playing a full court. Excuse the truck going by. <laughs> like he's playing a full court uh, in Rucker Park or something. Like he's waving at players as they go by. But I understand Houston wanting to lock him up for long term. I get it. You know, you know, you, you can't lose stars in this league. You know, but and I also want to talk about the, the Brooklyn Nets real quick. And this will be my last thing I want to say. You know, I hear a lot of people, uh, Chris Herring, uh, uh, just other Robin Lopez. I want to touch on something that Chris Herring said. You know, they went after Jeremy Lin, Tyler Johnson, and Alan Crabb. Now, the Jeremy Lin signing, I think, was a really good signing. I think that was a really good, reasonable signing. I like Jeremy Lin. I still think that teams, they don't, for some reason, don't let him run their team. I think he's very good. I really do think he's good. Is he star good? No, but he's starting He's starting point guard good. He's always been starting point guard good. But they spent $75 million on Alan Crabb and another $50 million on Tyler Johnson. They're, they're very young players. They have some talent. They're getting paid like they accomplished something. Now, I know we're in the new era and the new salary cap, and I know salaries are going to be higher. And I know that they both was restricted, so you had to overpay to get them. I get all of that. The one thing, though, and I don't know if people ever ask Brooklyn, because it's like Brooklyn's not on the radar here yet in New York. But 
Did they even go after some of the top free agents? Did they even try? Because their position is very is very tough. They don't have draft picks, I think, for the next two or three years. So I understand they're going after young players or going after players. But did they even attempt? Because Lopez is a good player. Did they have even attempt to go after the main guys? And I don't even mean, uh, what's his name, Kevin Durant. I mean, you can always give a call. See, this is how I think. At least make that phone call. You know what I'm saying? At least call and say, hey, you, hey, KD, just checking. Can we get a meeting? No, I right, peace. You have a good, you know, you take care. But you got to at least give a call. I mean, it's the same thing when I was younger. That was my philosophy when it came to women. I would always approach the most beautiful woman every single time. And that was me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm probably going to fail 90% of the time. But that one, that 10% or 99%, that 1% is still going to get me a bad chick. <laughs> I'm still going to get some that somebody that's beautiful. You got to try. So I don't know if they did. I'm not going to say they did or didn't. I'm not really sure. I don't know. I don't I haven't read anything on that. But it's funny because you know Chris Herring said, you know, he thought the Knicks would do things like this. Let me tell you something. If Phil Jackson would have gave this kind of money to these players, he would have been killed for that. He would have been killed for that. Now, everybody's applauding this GM that they signed. He's never done the job either. It is the funny thing about the bias against Phil. He's never done this job before. He, I mean, he was a part of a good organization, but he's never done this job. And first time out, he's given out big checks to unproven players. You know what? I wish I would have had my um, the internet open. I could have looked up these guys' stats, but I'm sure they both averaged under 10 points a game. I'm sure none of them had a, a PER or a PER rating over 20, over 15. These guys are probably, so right now, we don't even know. All right, Tyler Johnson, young player that has talent, but the truth be told, we don't know how good he is. You see? Because the league is funny. You'll have a spark, but once the league focuses on you, then we'll know who you are. Once the league adjusts to you, just like in baseball, they adjust to you. Remember Kevin Moss was hitting home runs for the Yankees? Like, what, seven straight games, eight straight games, and the league adjusted to him, and he was a scrub. He was out the league. I think he he damn near was out the league, or maybe he got hurt. I'm not really sure. I don't remember. I'm not going to look it up, but I know that the league adjusted to him. So when I look at Alan Crabb, I like him too. But at the end of the day, dude, it, it, he's proven to be a role player. You're giving him 75 and he can go up to $83 million based on incentives. Come on, man. So anyway, I just wanted to get that out there because, you know. Oh, and one, and one last thing I just wanted to say. Peace out to Derek Williams. I really did like you, man. I did like you. Uh... You know, you took five million to to join the Heat. They needed a small forward, so you might start. Um, I hope you do well. I really liked you, but now that I think about it, the guy we signed, Kuz, was cheaper than you. He was cheaper than Derek Williams. I'm never going to say he was good because Derek Williams is an NBA player. This guy, Kuz, we don't know. He may be. I'm going to trust in Phil and trust in the uh, the, the uh, recruiting that he is exactly. You know what the Knicks need as far as the floor spacer being able to run the floor and being athletic and he's ultra aggressive we'll see well that's the NBA news for you we're going to move on to our next segment it's called what the fuck man what the fuck <laughs> Music brought to you by bensound.com. So Charles Barkley. <laughs> so Charles Barkley, you know, got on his high horse like he likes to do all the time. And he started talking about uh, Kevin Durant cheating his way towards a championship and uh, old you know uh, Patrick Ewing didn't try to do that 
Charles Barkley was saying he didn't try to do that. And, and Stockton and Malone didn't try to do that. You know, and, and saying these guys really feel like they need to win a chip. Just a bunch of stuff that I find to be very hypocritical. And uh, the reason why I say that is, first of all, Barkley did try to make his way over to Houston after he couldn't win with Phoenix. Now, he was 33, albeit. He wasn't the player he was, but he still tried to do that. And face it, Charles, these guys are smarter than y'all. Take one for the team, ass fools. Nah, man. Nah, again. He, he had to play. He was forced to play for Oklahoma City. You know? I don't think it's anything wrong with what he's doing. Cheating his way to a championship? Ain't nothing guaranteed, bruh. Ain't nothing guaranteed. They can mess around and lose. You know, it, it, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, I understand he's saying he's he was disappointed at the decision and he's not going to hate while he's hating on Durant, saying he's not going to hate on Durant, you know. He says, I'm a big Chris Paul fan. I'm sure Chris Paul wants to win a championship. And he could, when his contract is up, go join one of these super teams and get a championship. Now, I'm going to stop you right there. Chris Paul is on a super team, but they just been injured. You know what I'm saying? Chris Paul is on a very good team that just has a lot of injuries. All right. Now, also, he made a comment that super teams are ruin, ruining the NBA. I think that was one of his comments. I can't find that that uh, quote, but I, I read it somewhere. But I want to talk about that. I want to take a second to talk about that. And also, before I get into that, though, I want to talk about, he said that uh, he's kind of cheating. He was cheating He's cheating to win a championship, right? So, you know the difference between the players today? Do you know the difference between what's going on today and what went on yesteryear? The difference is players didn't have the wherewithal, all the balls, to join up together because they were raised in this whole atmosphere of hate your enemy. Like, Magic would have never, Magic would have never joined Bird. You know? Uh, Dr. J would have never played in Boston. Jordan would have never played for the Pistons. You know, I, I hear this, but these guys are smarter now. I believe they're smarter. Now, of course, Jordan wouldn't have played for the Pistons because his team was championship made. His team was very good. But let's say, now, I know people are going to say, well, Kevin Durant's team was very good too. Yes, they were. But going into the future, I had mentioned it before in my first podcast about what should Kevin Durant do. And one thing I realized about Oklahoma City, they do not want to play that luxury tax. And when you have a really good team, you're going to end up paying luxury tax. They traded um, Harden when he could have just played, excuse me, played out the season. He didn't want to play. He didn't want to pay the luxury luxury tax. So he went to a team that's better and has deeper pockets. I can't blame him for that. So I'm going to be out here busting my ass and my short time to have this career. And you're going to keep trading away players like they traded Ibaka. I don't know if that sat well with him. Trading Ibaka for Oladipo now, now it turns out to be a good trade because they need another guy who has the star quality, which I think Oladipo does. But, Trust me, part of that trade had to do with the fact that Ibaka's salary, you know, he's 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 going to be a free agent, I think, next year. So they made that move with that in mind. And trust me, that's something that Kevin Durant was thinking about. You can't put it past him. Come on now. So now the difference between now and yesteryear is the players are putting together the super team teams rather than the GMs and the owners. Because let's look, Will Chamberlain got traded to the Lakers and they had Jerry West. That was a great team before Will Chamberlain got there and they traded him. So I guess the Lakers were cheating. 
or the GM was cheating. Who are you going to say was cheating? Maybe the GM was cheating when he made that trade. He's cheating. You know, he's getting, you know, I mean, GM cheated, I guess. You know, the Lakers, they got the number one pick when they had Kareem and already had a really great team. They got the number one pick in Magic Johnson. You know, back then, the GMs put the super teams But you know what? I understand the players of today. Excuse another truck going by. I live in New York City. I understand the players of today. They're looking around and saying, listen, if my GM ain't good, I need to make a move. If my GM or my organization doesn't want to spend the money, I'm not going to sit here and take one for the team. Fuck that. I'm not doing that. That makes no sense. You know, you making all this money off of me, but yet and still you can't give me what I need and surround me with the players I need to win. I'm sorry. Look what Cleveland did. They're way over the cap, and that's what they had to do to win. You got to be willing to do that in this league, or your best players are going to leave to teams who will do that, which is smart by them. Now, I want to address, oh, yeah, also Powell got traded to the Lakers when they had Kobe, prime Kobe. I guess the GM cheated. I noticed a lot of times the Lakers, because the Lakers do make power moves like that, and I don't know what they're going to do now, but they used to make power moves like that. Now, I want to get into something. Also, you said that Charles Barkley in another what the fuck you talking about moment also said super teams are bad for the NBA. That is patently and blatantly false. But before I get into that, let me just say this. Um, Godfather 2 by a lot of people, is considered one of the greatest movies ever made. One of the greatest films ever made in history. Even young people watch it today and like, wow. Do you know the actors that were in this film? You had Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Diane Keaton, Robert Duvall, Talia Shire, who played in Rocky, James Caan, Abe Vigoda, the guy who played uh, Soprano in Sopranos, he was the father. Dominique, I can't never say his last name. <laughs> Danny Aiello from Boys in the Hood. All of them people were in that same movie, in Godfather Two, which made it epic. It was great. Okay, now if we think about great teams, you said that super teams ruin the NBA or can ruin the NBA. But um, what brought the NBA, I think back in the eighties, the NBA finals was on tape delay and a young fellow named magic Johnson, another young fellow by, by the name of Larry bird. They started making it to the finals every year. Lakers went to the finals nine times in the eighties and Boston went there, I think five or six times. And the league actually grew because they had these super teams because people like to see the best teams go at it. And these two super teams brought the league up. And then along came Jordan. Of course, Detroit was before that, but Jordan had a super team also. Didn't hurt the NBA. Actually, the NBA was at an all time high when Jordan had his super team. Okay. The NBA is not a league that does well with parity because parity means that you got teams that suck. I'm sorry. I like to see the super teams go at it. Not only that, when you have the super teams, you also have upsets. You have upsets. Remember Georgetown had the super team and the NCAA and Villanova beat them by shooting 70% in the the championship game. Another uh, super team was the USSR and hockey. In the Olympics, they still talk about it today. And the USA team beat them. So those were super teams. That's another good thing people like about super teams is they like to see them get beat. So Golden State is going to be a traveling circus this year. Don't sleep on that. People are going to pay and watch Golden State. They're going to want to see. They're not going to care that they're slaughtering teams. People like super teams because people like excellence. This That's America. It's the American way. We like excellence. You know, so you you put all the, look at it. You have the 1998 Yankees. 
all up and down their lineup was great players. You had the 1927 Yankees with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. These, you ever notice that people still remember these, these great, great teams. So to me, it doesn't matter how they came together. It's how they perform. Cause at the end of the day, the NBA is not just about competitiveness. It's also about entertainment and the great players will show you, this is what great basketball is supposed to look like. This is what it's supposed to look like. So Charles Barkley, I know you, you get paid to say a lot of bullshit, but that was some bullshit. And Reggie Miller, I'll give you an honorable mention because I know you said some bullshit too, but I'm not even going to entertain that shit, Reggie. <laughs> I'm not even going to entertain that shit. But anyway, that has been my what the fuck you talking about segment. Now we're going to move on to the topic, or should I say topics of the week. Right now, we're going to get into our topics of the week. You know, Phil Jackson said he likes this team. (laughs) So, I got a question. With the new revamped roster, are the Knicks contenders? Yes, you heard me right. Now, you might say contenders for what? Contenders for the playoffs? Contenders for a championship? Well, I'm going to say contenders for a championship. I'm asking the question, are the Knicks contenders for a championship? Because I don't believe in... uh, If you're in the playoffs, you have a chance to win. Now, it's even if it's slim, I'm sorry. I'm one of them people who think even if it's 1%, that's still technically a chance. You know, no chance would mean you're not in the playoffs. So when I ask the question, are the Knicks contenders, if you say there'll be a playoff team, then to me, the answer is yes. You know, uh, we've seen, and it was the Knicks, and it was a shortened season, but the eighth seed went to the championship. So if you're in the playoffs, you're a contender. Now, let me get to talking about the Knicks now. So, you know, I know a lot of people will listen to this and say, oh, man, this guy's wilding. Talk about, oh, the Knicks are contenders and they got all these injured players and this and that. And, you know, and I heard a guy call a radio station talking about, I'm so sick of these fans. They get all excited. One little thing happens and they get excited and they need to calm down. And I don't understand that line of thinking. There's nothing wrong with being optimistic. There's nothing wrong with being positive about your team. You know, you know, you got two kind. you got, you got, you got the optimistic fan, you know, who is just like optimistic and hopes they do well. And if they don't do well, see, I'm that fan that if they don't do well, it's like, oh, well, well, my life is fine. But then you have that fan who is pessimistic, who just res- rather uh, be miserable all the time and hate everything like that. That's the kind of fan that that they, they won't be excited. They're really being negative because they're really super fans and it, they're they're trying to uh, temper their enthusiasm by being negative until the team starts showing that they're good. Then they're all excited. And I'm like. That's a constant state of being miserable because only one team can win every year. So, you know, but, you know, I don't understand that thinking. Then you have people who say, oh, I don't want to get my hopes up. Like, I'm like, dude, if you're a grown up, if you're a grown up and not a child, only people I don't want getting their hopes up is a child. If you're nine, ten years old, I remember I was a Jet fan. I was probably... How old was I? I was, I don't know. I was about like, I know Richard Todd was playing. Now, yeah, yeah, Richard Todd. They was in the playoffs. I think they was playing the Bills. And they lost, and I cried. And the very next year, matter of fact, it had to be the year before LT was uh, drafted. Because then when the Giants got LT, I became a Giant fan. 
and I've been a Giant fan ever since. But I cried when they lost. And that's a normal response for somebody who's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. You know, I, you know but if you're 25, talking about, I don't want to get too hyped because I don't want to be let down. I'm like, what the fuck is your problem? It's just a sport, dude. It's okay to be excited for your team. And if they lose, you carry on with your life. Because you know what I realized? I'm a Yankee fan. And I've been a Yankee fan basically as far as back as I can remember. I live, I grew up in the Bronx. I don't live in the Bronx now, but I grew up in the Bronx. And I remember I was very young when they were good in 77 and 78. And I think they lost in 81. I was very young. I don't remember that much about it. But I remember them in the mid 80s just not being good for a long time. Having, I remember when they had Ricky Henderson. They had all this hitters and all this excitement and all of this and then finally you know come along 96 or 94 95 you know they started getting better and i remember when they won the world series uh it was great it was euphoric but then after that i had a sobering moment it was like okay all of this rooting and rooting and my team won the championship and tomorrow I got to get up and go to work. Yeah, I'm going to have a smile on my face, but nothing changed for me. So you put all your, in, your you, you put all your, this energy into being a fan. And then when your team actually does win, forget about losing. When they actually win, you realize, okay, yay. And that's it. And that's it. You know, yay, they won. And that's it. So, I'm not saying don't be a fan and don't be happy and don't be ecstatic. But at some point you have to realize this is entertainment. If they win, great. I just want my team to give me enjoyment. When I watched the Knicks in the 90s, they gave me enjoyment. They didn't win a championship. They were very relevant. Every year they had a chance to do something. We just got beat by somebody better. I'm not going to look at that. Oh, that's a waste because we didn't win. No, I bet you them people of Utah would love to have that time back when they were going back to the finals, even though they lost. Just like Nick fans. We just want to, a lot of Nick fans just want to see what the, feel like, be a part of the playoffs. So, only thing I'm saying as far as the fans, and I'm going to get back to what I was saying, you know, uh, are the Knicks contenders, and I'm going to break it down. But, you know, it's just this funny thing, this, these fan rules that that just, it bugs me out. I don't understand them. As I've gotten older, you know, my father did me a favor. You know, when the Knicks were really bad for a while there, right after Patrick Ewing, like, you know, they, you know, the last 15 years, basically, my father made a good point to me. He said, listen, son, you know, be a fan of the NBA and you'll never be disappointed. And that's when I started looking at it differently. I'm a fan of the Knicks. Yes, I love the Knicks. But guess what? When they're not good and they suck, I'm not watching. I'm not going to be spending my time arguing with people about how bad the Knicks are. And and, and, and I'm not going to be that fan. When they're bad, I treat them like entertainment. Even this year, I watched. Once I realized they weren't good, you know, you watch for the young player. I want to see what Chris Stapps is doing. But after a while, it's like, okay, I'll read the stats at the end of the game. You know, and if there's something special happen, I'll go back and see it on video then. But... I'm not going to sit here. I remember one fan was like, all the time I spent all my money when they were losing. And now that they're winning, they want to raise the price. I'm like, yeah, because you're a fool to spend your money when they're losing. Why would you do that? Because you're a fan? No, you're a fool. I'm sorry. Would you go see a Broadway play that sucked? Would you do that? Would you go? Would you? uh, You know, the Broadway play sucks. You would go spend your money on that. You know, a movie sucks. You would go spend your money on that. Then why fans do it? But anyway, that's enough of that. But I, I, I just, that, that just was in my mind, and I had wanted to talk about that. Now, the Knicks, I believe the Knicks are contenders. Yes, for a championship. Yes. Yes. And first of all, I'm going to mention Max Kellerman. He works on ESPN LA, and he made a good point. They have three. The Knicks have three franchise players on their team. Three supremely talented players. We're going to talk about injuries. Everybody talks about injuries. 
But the fact is the talent is there. Derrick Rose is talented. There's no doubt. If he's healthy, he's a stud. He's a star and he's 27. Melo is still Melo. Melo is still Melo. Melo's a stud. Don't get it twisted. Uh, Christos Przingis is a supremely talented two-way player. That's going to be a bigger part of the offense right now. Now, to, in addition to that, Courtney Lee is the perfect complement to Derrick Rose. Did Derrick Rose ever have that compliment in Chicago? You know, they want to always point to, oh, Derrick Rose shot badly. He was a poor point guard. See, stats lie. That's why you got to watch the game because stats do lie sometimes. Or better yet, you don't see the whole variable. Yes, he was asked to shoot a lot on his team. He had to do that. Teams keyed on him. You understand what I'm saying? Teams keyed on him. So his degree of difficulty in shots is gonna is is gonna take his uh, shooting percentage down. But how many offensive rebounds he creates by just penetrating and drawing his man, like Kristaps Porzingis said? He said, "Look, I'm just looking forward to all the tip dunks I'm gonna get because he's gonna draw the defense in, and my man's not gonna box him out. His man is not gonna box him out, and he's gonna be dunking it. That's what happens when you have a great penetrator and a shot creator. You know, and like I said." And like everybody's realizing now, it's like they're waking up. Derrick Rose has never played with an offensive weapon as Melo. Actually, Melo, he played with Iverson. And that's another thing, too. Speaking of Melo playing with Iverson, you know, I'm going to give Bomani the credit, Bomani Jones the credit on this because Bomani Jones is the one who said Melo can play with a guy who's used to having the ball a lot because he played with Iverson and J.R. Smith. Y'all got Melo all wrong. Melo is not selfish. You know, look how Melo plays in the Olympics. Does he dominate the ball then? No, he know he's playing with other great players. He plays his position. And I think that's all Melo wants to do. That's all he's wanted to do. I want to play my position. I can shoot. I can score. I can get open. But I want teammates to help me. He's always wanted that. He never wanted to carry the load like that. He just wanted to win. That's what I believe with Melo. But, of course, he got a bad rap. Now, if the Knicks, I'm going to just say this real quick, just for the record. If the Knicks turn out and be really good and get to the conference finals this year and really be like a 55-win team, watch how people say Melo changed. You're going to hear this bullshit that Melo changed. He's a different player. He's the same fucking player he's always been. Even, all right, for example, his MVP season, well, when he was second in the voting to LeBron James, he was NBA all he was all NBA first team that year. That very next year, the team didn't make the playoffs. His stats were identical. And he didn't even make the NBA third team. Kevin Love was on that team. <laughs> it's just so you know, it's just ridiculous. So so you got three franchise type players in the starting lineup. You have a complement to those players. Courtney Lee compliments Carmelo Anthony on the offense and compliments Derrick Rose on the offense, compliments Derrick Rose on the defense also. He can probably guard the team's opposing point guard if that's possible, depending on the the matchups, you know. Then you have another glue guy in Joe Kim Noah who doesn't need the ball. He's like a better version of, of Tyson Chandler. Now I know he's coming off in- injury and a lot of people say, why, why am I saying he's a better version in Tyson Chandler? Cause Tyson Chandler was just a screen setter. He was a very good defender, but he was not the passer and facilitator that Joe Kim Noah is. He's an amazing facilitator. There's no doubt about that. And he's a perfect glue guy. He's going to give you his all. And those guys are supporting then we got this six man coming off the bench and Brandon Jennings, who would start for a lot of teams in this league. They're worrying about him being hurt. He's not hurt. I saw him last year. He's fine. He came here for five million. You got to give Phil his props on that. I thought that guy was going to get 10 to 12 million. I guess people were scared of that injury, you know, but I have to assume. I have to assume health. I have to trust The Knicks staff, I have to trust Phil Jackson, and I have to assume that they're going to be healthy. Now, Derrick Rose is not going to be the springboard player he was 
a few years back before that injury. But I was I've been looking at a lot of those tapes and Derrick Rose is still quicker than most of the guards in the league, yo. He's still going to be able to penetrate. And everybody knows when Melo plays in Olympics, he has a great year after that. He's done it each time. And also another thing about Melo is uh when he plays with a really good point guard, why does he have his best seasons when that happens? So where is this Melo selfish shit? He's had his best seasons when he's had a good point guard. Melo knows how to play with other players. I don't know where this, this stupid stuff comes from. I heard Brian Winhorst say that, and I thought it was stupid. He said, oh, well, Melo's used to having the ball in his hands. Um, Yeah, when you don't have a point guard. When your point guard's Calderon, yeah, he's going to have the ball in his hands. When, that, when that's your point guard. But when his point guard was Jason Kidd, what he was doing? He was finding his spot on the floor and killing him, period. When his point guard was, 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 um, good Lord, I can't believe Chauncey Billups, he was finding his spots and killing them. So people need to stop that BS, you know? So when I look at it, I think the Knicks are contenders this year. They have some great players. I'm expecting to still be great. You know, Lance Thomas, another guy. Now I think an issue for the Knicks is their bench. And remember, I'll just tell you this, a good bench is important for the regular season, not as important in the playoffs. As you can see in the playoffs, the best players play the bulk of the minutes. So the bench gets negated because you're not going to have your bench players in when you're, when the star players of the other team are playing majority of those minutes. You're not going to do that. You're going to have to let, you know, because your bench players aren't as good as the other team starters. However, during the season, you need your bench players. So I have confidence in Brandon Jennings. I have confidence in Lance Thomas, but after that, yes, there's some holes. I think Lance Thomas is going to play 25 to 30 minutes a night. I think the same thing with Brandon Jennings. So, I was just reading something. <laughs> I thought I was running out of disk space. So, if you if you if you look at that, then the next guy we have Kylo Quinn. As uh, Phil Jackson said, we're going to lean on Kylo Quinn. That we're going to let him, we're going to lean on him to play backup center, I guess backup power forward. It all depends on Hornacek because we can go small. We can slide uh, Lee over to the uh, three position depending because some teams play three guards. If you play in three guards, we can play three guards. We can literally play three guards and play small. We can play Derrick Rose, um, Brandon Jennings, Lee, Mello and Przingis, and everybody can shoot the three on that team. Now, everybody's not great shooting the three. The only really good three-point shooters would be Mello, Przingis, and Lee, and the other two guys can penetrate. I mean, that is that's deadly. But like I said, this guy, Kuz, they picked up. I'm not going to attempt to say his name. It looks like he's going to be getting playing time. Hopefully, he's good. We're going to see. He's 6'9", 230. He's a physical specimen. He's athletic. It seems like he's going to get playing time like now. Like he's been brought in to replace Derrick Williams. So we'll see. But like I said, these players are used to winning. They all come from winning cultures. That part of Phil's job is done and complete. He's going to have some, con there's also there's some congruency. Derrick Rose has played with Noah before. That's very important. When you have players who... It, Melo has played with Przingis and, 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 and Thomas before. Przingis has played with Her, Hernan Gomez before. That's important to try to find players who know each other because you're going to have a lot of roster turnover, exactly what Phil Jackson said. So, again, I'm going to end this, this topic. I do believe the Knicks are contenders. I won't put a number on how many games I think they're going to win or anything like that. But just remember that you're putting these players around a still prime mellow. Mellow still prime. So you're putting these type players around a prime mellow and a prime Derrick Rose, if you want to be real about it. And a and a person who's in in, in Chris Stapps, I don't know what to expect. But he's gonna be excuse me, he's gonna be featured a lot more. So <laughs> I think the sky's the limit, man. You know, hey, we don't know what the future holds, but why not be optimistic? 
I don't think what what is it hurting? If the Knicks suck and don't make the playoffs, they get a high draft pick. I'm going to be optimistic regardless. It does not matter. But if you ask me today, with Derrick Rose, Courtney Lee, Carmelo Anthony, Kristaps Porzingis, Joe Kim Noah, are the Knicks contenders? Yes. And if you want to worry about the bench, Jeff Hornacek is going to stagger the starters. He's going to always keep one of those scorers in the game at all times. Derrick Rose, Carmelo, or Porzingis are going to be on the floor at all times. They're going to mix and match, but keep the, the, the main scorer on the floor. They have a big three, folks. And you know, if Derrick Rose is Derrick Rose, not the MVP Derrick Rose, but a, Derrick, a better Derrick Rose where he shoots a little bit of a jump shot that can still penetrate, man... I'm done. Now, the next topic I want to get into is should athletes be more vocal when it comes to social issues? And what brings me to this is basically Carmelo Anthony. Now, I'm going to read an excerpt. Actually, it's not even an excerpt. It's the whole statement he made. You know, and, and the reason why I started out before is like Anthony, uh, Carmelo Anthony being all righteous because he started off on an Instagram post saying, uh, first of all, all praises do. So I just was joking about that. But um, I'm going to read what he what he put in the Daily News or what was put in the Daily News by Carmelo Anthony. The system is broken, point blank, period. It has been this way forever. Martin Luther King marched, Malcolm X rebelled, Muhammad Ali literally fought for us. I don't want to say for us or of us. That's why I studied there. Anyway, our anger should be toward the system. If the system does not change, we will continue to turn on the TV and see the same thing. We have to put pressure on the people in charge in order to get this thing we call justice right. A march doesn't work. We tried that. I've tried that. A couple of social media post tweet does, doesn't work. We've all tried that. That didn't work. Shooting 11 cops and killing five will not work. While I don't have a solution, I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't have a solution. But we need to come together more than anything at this time. We need each other. These politicians have to step up and fight for change. Go to your local officials leaders, congressmen, assemblymen, assemblywomen, and demand change. There's no more sitting back and being afraid of tackling and addressing political issues anymore. Those days are long gone. We have to step up and take charge. We can't worry about what endorsement we're, what endorsements we're going to lose or who's going to look who's going to look at us crazy. I need your voices to be heard. We can demand change. We have to be willing to. The time is now. I'm all in. Take charge. Take action. Demand change. Carmelo Anthony. Now, pardon my little stutter earlier, but the way it was worded here, it it just seems, it said Muhammad Ali literally fought of us. I don't know if it meant off, off U.S. or for you, I, I I don't know. Maybe it was a typo. It kind of threw me off. But anyway, I want to address a few things he said. Carmelo, more power to you, brother. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Putting yourself out there like that, not being neutral, because people are dying in the street, and it's a serious situation. But I do disagree with a few things that you have said here. So... You said Let me just find a line I don't want to misquote him He said a march doesn't work We've tried that I've tried that A couple of social media post tweets Doesn't work We've all tried that That didn't work Shooting 11 cops and killing 5 will not work Now I'm going to stop right there The cop thing I will get to last, but I disagree. Marching does work. Tweeting does work, but it depends on what do you want it to work? What what do you want to happen when you march? You know why you march? You march to bring awareness to your situation. So right now to the things that's going on in America, 
It is bringing awareness. We need to take the next step. Tweeting, social media is awareness. We're talking about it. That's the first step to fixing anything is awareness, being aware of the problem. An alcoholic cannot stop being alcoholic if he doesn't, if he's not aware of it or he doesn't admit it. Awareness is very important component to growth. You have to be aware. So I disagree that it doesn't work. It does work, but by itself, we need to do, we got into this position as a country because of many different things. It's layered. So we need to take the same layered approach to fix or better yet change what's going on. You know, as far as killing the cops, I don't agree with that. I don't harming cops, harming innocent people is not good ever. But the thing is that people mistaken is that out of violence comes change. Now people might say, Oh, you mean these cops should be killed? No, no, I do not mean those cops should be killed, but I noticed before those, excuse me, before those cops were shot, I would turn on the radio. I would turn on the radio. I always turn on my sports stations and the sports stations always had something to say about the gay community having rights while in all the black people are getting shot left and right. And I'm not hearing anything. Then when the cops got shot, it forced besides Bomani Jones, by the way, it forced people to talk about these issues. You cannot talk about the cops being shot without talking about the conditions that are affecting the African-American people right now. So that conversation was spurred on by that violence. No matter how wrong it was, it spurred it on. I wish it wouldn't have happened. It did happen. And now we're forced to deal with this situation. It's a powder keg. It's been one for years. Now we can't sit by quietly. You know, and, 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 and the question was, should now I want to get back. That was my opinion. Now, let me get back to what he was saying. Now, I do agree that we need to revamp the system. We do. I think we need to revamp the system. We need to look at these archaic laws. Some of these laws are bad. Some of the way the police handle things are bad, but I believe, again, I'm not blaming the officers anymore. I don't blame them. They're following orders. And you can't tell me that a cop did bad or it's the cop's fault when the system that employs the cop consistently lets him go free, does not arrest him, does not bring up charges. So if that's the case, I can't blame the cop because if you're letting him go, you obviously believe he did the right thing. So I can't blame the cop. So anyway, I'm sorry. Let me get back. Should athletes, should athletes take a stance in social issues? Should they be more vocal? LeBron James had a chance to be more vocal with the, with the situation with the I can't breathe shirt. And he chose not to. I don't knock athletes for not being more vocal. I mean, look, you can, there's other ways you can do positive things. You know, I mean, education. You can put money into that. LeBron puts a lot of money into education. So I'm never going to look at LeBron and say, oh, you're a sellout. You didn't speak up. Not everybody has to do it. Nobody, everybody doesn't have the capacity to do it. Because sometimes talking is just talking. It's great when we see somebody who's famous use their platform but at the same time, it's not action, it's words. So it's more awareness to the situation. So, but I will say this, if we look back in history, just about every athlete who took a stance on social issues are deemed legendary because of that. Jim Brown is well-respected now yeah, maybe he don't have the money he would have had, but he's well respected because he took a stance. Muhammad Ali just died and people are just everywhere falling over themselves, Muhammad Ali. Because he took a stance.
Because, see, basketball is 82 games a season plus the playoffs. Football is 16 games per season plus the playoffs. Baseball is 162 games plus the playoffs. Life is the entire year. It's every day. It's every night. So when they speak on these things, I can't knock them. I I, I applaud them. But I'm not going to penalize the ones who don't speak. But I'll say this. You can find a cause. It doesn't have to be civil rights. It doesn't have to be rights for, 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 for African Americans, rights for women. It could be animal rights. There's so many things in this world that need correcting. You can stand up for hunger. Everybody will be on your side for that. There's nothing wrong with speaking against hunger. You can speak against violence. You can speak against bullying. There's a lot of things you can speak against. So that won't put your brand in jeopardy, especially if you speak against hunger. If you take a, 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 if you really try to feed the hungry, come on, you're going to blow up even more. Even the corporations that support you in that. So there's nothing stopping you from doing that. An organization to educate people. That's a social issue. So there's many issues you can choose. So I, yes, I do believe athletes who are in a position of power, being that they're still stars, being that they still have money, that it won't hurt them. Uh, I think they should use their platform and their face and their money to bring awareness and solutions and actions to actual problems. Like I just stated, you know, hunger is a big problem in this world and in this country. Health care. I'm not even talking about, I'm talking about like nutrition. These athletes are a tip top shape. Why don't they speak on nutrition? Well, a lot of people are not really in good shape. Their workouts, they get, there's so much things they can do. So yes, I do believe athletes should take more of a social stance. And I'm not just talking about black athletes. I'm talking about all athletes because there's problems in this world that need to be dealt with. Now, I'm not letting other kind of people off the hook, but think about the singers. What is the iconic song that Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King, I'm sorry, <laughs> that Marvin Gaye made? Mercy, mercy me. What's going on? It's legendary. It's legendary. You know? So anytime people take social stances, it's, 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 it resonates with the people throughout time, throughout history. It stands. Nelson Mandela, he's not an athlete, obviously, but he took a stance, put his life on the line for a cause. He will never be forgotten. So you become immortal when you do these kind of things. Now, you shouldn't do it to become immortal, but you become immortal when you do these kind of things. So Carmelo Anthony, more power to you. You know, this is a sports podcast. I probably won't talk about social issues. Only reason I'm talking about them now is because it it actually was a Nick player and a basketball player who talked about in Carmelo Anthony. So normally I won't get into social issues on this sports podcast. I won't do that, but I had to do it for this episode because right now there's a lot going on. My condolences to all the families who've lost people, the families of the police officers that are affected, the friends, you know, uh, the woman who lost her boyfriend, who was, who was bold and, you know, who was, had the presence of mind to videotape, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. So, so that's really all I got to say on it. I mean, again, I would urge people to vote in your local elections. Judges have to be voted in. DAs have to be voted in. Congressmen and senators, mayors, you have to vote in those things. Don't worry about the federal, the presidential vote. That's important. But these areas where you need to pay attention to, you know, I mean, I thought that when the NBA players came together against Donald Sterling, it was a no brainer. They had to. And I respect it. You have to. So, again, I would urge NBA players, if they can hear me, they probably won't hear this, but pick up an issue. 
It'll make your life. It'll make your life better. Trust me. It'll make you more fulfilled when you help someone in need. We all know how that feeling is. I helped the old lady across the street and I felt good about it. You know, I, I, I had a little more swag because I did something nice. I did something good. We've all been there when we've done something nice and we know that, that, that the universe is smiling on us. People are smiling on us. You just feel good when you do good things. So that's all I got to say. That brings us to an end of another podcast. It's been real. Once again, I'm going to do one of these once a week. I will try to increase eventually. I'm still learning how to how to put this whole thing together. It's been a fun experience. Hang in there with me. They will get better over time. I will eventually have visitors and things like that. You can also check me out on uh, Twitter. It's at Nick Show. On Twitter, I'm at Nick Show. And remember, it's it's two S's. It's Nick's plural show. So, you know, you can follow me on there. And basically, it's strictly basketball. I don't do anything but basketball on that Twitter uh, site. I basically I'll retweet things I've read from Ian Begley or other people, Chris Herring. You know, I, I like to do it that way. I'll put my own opinions, my little rants and stuff like that. So tune into it. it it's really good. It's really good. So anyway, um, everybody be safe out there. Let's love one another and uh, let's be peaceful. Let's be peaceful. Let's be loving. You know, that's all I got to say on the matter. So I got to say peace. Take care.